Welcome to Today in Mental Health, Caring from a Distance. I'm Roger McIntyre, psychiatrist at the University of Toronto. My pleasure to be moderating today's session. I want to start off by, first of all, thanking Synovian for a uh, grant support to make this event happen. I also want to thank NEI for the uh, management and the organization behind this uh, particular program. And I want to encourage all of you to keep a hand on your mouse. In other words, we're going to be asking to you for you to submit any questions you'd like throughout the program. We've got three presenters today. I think the topic could not be any more timely. We're going to be speaking to two interrelated topics. That is the impact of COVID-19 on mental health, and more specifically, the impact on COVID-19 on our practice as healthcare providers attempting to provide timely uh, quality care to people who are affected by a mental disorder. Before I introduce my colleagues, a few introductory remarks just to sort of set the stage of sorts. I've referred to the last six months as the triple threat. In other words, this is not just a public health crisis, this is an economic crisis and a mental health crisis. And it is affecting not just the high income countries, but also the low and middle income countries. This is truly a global event. There's now in fact been reports that we've contributed to and other groups of, as well, of rising rates of mental disorders in many parts of the world including but not limited to depression and post-traumatic stress, as well as anxiety disorders. We also, in fact, have concerns about rising rates of suicide. In fact, it's been reported during the Great Recession, as well as previous shocks of an economic nature, that rising unemployment is highly associated with increases in suicide. For example, we've recently reported in North America that for each 1% increase in unemployment, we could project out a commensurate increase of 1% in suicide. These are very, very significant times. Now, the event that we're in now is clearly unprecedented, and I think unprecedented is the right word. It's not hyperbole. It truly is. And these events were prefaced. I always say that the pandemic was prefaced by an epidemic an epidemic of loneliness. And this has been described across the H band, right across the world. The loneliness epidemic known to predispose and portend chronic diseases like obesity and heart disease, but also known to predispose to suicide, especially in younger people. And it's that younger people that I wanted to pick up on. They're not the only group that we're interested in, but we're really, in fact, seeing select subgroups, especially at risk, including young people. For example, the Centers for Disease Control in the last month has reported that around 25% of people, 18 to 24, seriously thought about suicide in the last 30 days. This is an incredible statistic. And these statistics, again, come on the tails of other lines of research, for example, from NORC at the University of Chicago, that only about 15 to 20% of Americans would report themselves as being content and feeling happy in their life. So taken together, this is an event like no other. The hazards that are posed on mental health are difficult to, in fact, describe. And as we speak, there's efforts going on around the world to not only identify groups at risk and to identify which types of mental disorders are especially uh, more likely to be encountered during this time, but also, on a more promising note, what we can do as uh, public health officials, as advocates for people who have mental illness or who are at risk of mental illness, what we can do to mitigate the risk. I say that you know, flattening the curve is not the objective. It's flattening the curve and preventing the curve. In other words, flattening the curve of the virus, but preventing the curve of suicide as well as mental disorders that are associated with suicide. I, in fact, just got off a call uh, earlier today where I was speaking with colleagues uh, of mine. We're doing a study in China, looking at, among other things, some of the moderating factors of risk for mental illness in people in China exposed to this trifecta. Again, the public health crisis, the economic crisis, and the mental health crisis. And what was so interesting about that <clears throat> is we are finding that there's many factors that we can moderate. One of the factors that we found, which I thought was very interesting, was the issue of portion control. Now, when we talk about portion control, I usually think about how much food I'm taking in or how much alcohol I'm drinking, and that includes that. But what I'm referring to is also social media consumption. I thought you'd find it very interesting 
that in young people, those over the under the age of 25, those that consume more social media are also persons more likely to res, uh, report new onset depression and anxiety disorders in the context of COVID-19. That's an association, that's not causation, but it gets us thinking about factors that we can begin thinking about how we can intervene and how we can intervene in the general population, but also how we can intervene in our clinics. And that's my segue now, it's my own experience. Six months ago, like everybody else, we were faced with this virtualized world. I, in fact, did have a hybrid practice before this began in, in about February, March of this year. In other words, I had a brick and mortar clinic at the university and I did do some telepsychiatry, uh, maybe about 10 to 20 percent of my practice. Now, like many, it turned into about 100 um, percent. And I suspect that once COVID is behind us, we look forward to that, that my practice will look more like uh, more and more hybrid in the sense it'll be probably a much higher allocation of my time will be spent with respect to the virtual uh, interaction with patients and families. Perhaps the, the change for me was one more of quantity than quality. In other words, I spend more time on telepsychiatry, but my overall activities didn't change a whole lot because I'd spent a lot of time doing telepsychiatry to begin with. Um, but one of the uh, aspects about this that really came into very cold clarity for me that I had perhaps not marinated as much as I should have is how to handle situations that are commonplace in my practice. I run a mood disorders program. I see people who are very suicidal, who are very at risk of self-harm, and trying to manage aspects of the psychiatric emergency. For example, people at risk of suicide in the context of virtual healthcare, something I've had to do more in the last six months than I have my entire career. Other aspects as well with respect to in, you know, integrating care. And this has been one of the more positive externalities, one of the more positive unintended consequences of this COVID-19 is in fact the opportunity to integrate care with other care providers as part of the care team, including not just social workers and physician assistants, but also employers and other family members uh, as part of the team to name a few others. So I think in fact, um, we are gonna be talking about COVID-19 for many, many years from now. This is a threat to mental health like I can't uh, really find in the history books, but it's also an opportunity. And it's an opportunity for us to rethink the way we're providing care for people, not just in those who have a declared mental illness, but also from a more societal level, some of the public health initiatives that we can begin to think about that simultaneously mitigate risk, but also augment the resiliency of our population, because we're gonna be hearing a lot more about risk and resiliency in the general population public health sphere. So with that, I want to in fact uh, pivot, and I want to uh, now invite our, our first speaker, uh, for today's event is Dr. Doug Eichelheimer. And Doug is a psychiatrist, he is in Colorado. And Doug would certainly receive anyone's vote as an early adopter. Uh, Doug has been working as a full-time on-demand telepsychiatrist, full-time for the last eight years. In fact, telepsychiatry going back to 2005. So Doug clearly has the ability to see the future in ways uh, uh, that I've not seen before. And Doug and I uh, have been discussing his practice, and I was interested to hear that he is not simply seeing outpatients in a general psychiatry practice. He's seeing people with substance use disorders and also in the emergency, to name a few other uh, ecosystems and populations. And so, uh, Doug, welcome to today's program. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. McIntyre. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I, I identified telepsychiatry in my early days as a psychiatrist. Uh, working for uh, Denver Health, the county hospital in Denver. Uh, it was approximately 2004, and I was working full-time in the psychiatric emergency service. Um, and I also uh, was working in a Suboxone clinic at Denver Health, uh, treat, treating patients who uh, came in from all over Colorado, in some cases driving many hours to see me for a brief 15-minute med check uh, in order to re receive their Suboxone prescription for the management of their opioid dependence. Um, and it was around that same time that I was doing my first Skype meetings with various family members, and I, I kind of put two and two together. 
and realized that I could entirely meet the standard of care of traditional outpatient psychiatry uh, while seeing patients by video. So it was in approximately 2005 that I opened what may have been the first home-based telepsychiatry clinic. Um, and for the next uh, 10 years, approximately, I treated patients from all over Colorado for mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and opioid maintenance uh, using Suboxone. The key, of course, is that I was meeting the standard of care of traditional outpatient psychiatry in all other ways, including things like physical examination, laboratory investigations by the primary care doctor, vital signs, a random urine toxicology screening, traditional outpatient support groups, et cetera. And um, patients really enjoyed the, uh, the convenience and, uh, and the access that they were afforded through my uh, home-based telepsychiatry clinic. That's a great story, uh, Doug. Uh, with respect to the access, and that's something certainly my patients have described as well, the efficiencies built in. Um, what would you say are some of the do's and don'ts that you've learned over the years with telepsychiatry? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, the, the number one thing to realize is that telepsychiatry is not a new form of practice. Uh, rather, it's just, a, it's just the harnessing of technology to provide services you're already providing to a, a wider population. Uh, so the number one do is, do see the same patients you're already seeing in your practice. Uh, and don't change your practice in any other way other than to harness the secure video technology to perform the interview and mental status examination um, that you would otherwise be performing in person. Uh, other do's and don'ts. Uh, do practice within your own state licensure. And uh, of course, this is defined uh, by the location of the patient. So the uh, the clinical contact, by definition, occurs uh, at the location of the patient, and you must be licensed within that jurisdiction, within that state. Now, uh, some of these uh, issues are changing with regard to the, um, the arrival on the scene of the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which is a, uh, a process of several states, and, and in some cases, and going to be many states, cooperatively sharing uh, licensure for the purposes of practicing telemedicine. That's, that's an ever-evolving story, the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. But be sure that you are practicing in your own licensure as defined by the location of the patient. Uh, do use a private setting with a neutral backup, uh, a backdrop. Um, uh, always use front lighting, never, never uh, any bright lights behind you, otherwise your patients will only see a silhouette. Uh, maintain HIPAA compliance uh, for all aspects of your practice, including the video platform, scheduling and billing. Uh, do occasionally look into the camera so the patient has the experience of eye contact, um, even if for the clinician is somewhat artificial uh, momentarily to be looking into the camera. Uh, those are those are really some of the main do's and don'ts. That's very helpful. You were very clear in highlighting the uh, residence of the person you're speaking to is de facto where that clinical contact took place. Would you see a patient who was, for example, from Colorado who took a trip to Mexico on holiday and they want to contact you from Mexico? Would you have seen them from Mexico out of country? Ah, uh, Yes. Uh, excellent question. Uh, well, uh, let's see. I mean, if the de novo doctor patient relationship is established under appropriate licensure within the USA, uh, then yes, it would be appropriate to see a patient when he or she is out of the country uh, for a brief uh, visit, a support, uh, or you know, uh, uh, questions that the, that the patient may have while they are outside of the country. Uh, but of course, I would avoid attempts or avoid uh, you know, prescribing for this uh, patient when they are outside of the United States. Uh, but the main thing is, as long as you establish the re relationship inside the United States and in, under your own licensure, it'd be okay to visit a patient with a you know one-off visit by phone or or video uh, for some kind of urgent meeting. That that would be okay. 
Doug, a more basic question, but one that I've encountered more in the last six months than I ever have, is that many of my patients cannot afford broadband and Wi-Fi. In fact, Canada and the United States pay some of the highest rates in the world for broadband and Wi-Fi. So I've had many patients over the years who've contacted me from their local McDonald's or their local Starbucks or what have you to get a public mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. What's your view on public Wi-Fi? You mentioned HIPAA compliance earlier. Yes, that, that's a that's another fascinating question. Uh, in my private uh, practice, I have had uh, some patients who would try to conduct video sessions from their car uh, outside of a fast food restaurant trying to use the, the uh, restaurant's Wi-Fi. Um, you know, uh, historically, I would allow that uh, uh, as a one-off or as, uh, on a single occasion, uh, while at the same time, uh, you know, encouraging the patient that they really need to be accessing me from a private setting uh, in order to continue accessing my services. Um, I have had occasions where I needed to discharge patients from my clinic because they were not able to routinely access me from, from a uh, traditional sort of private setting. Um, the other thing I would mention is that, you know, my own personal uh, one bugaboo that I have is that I, I really need the camera on the patient side to be situated on a hard surface, um, like a table or uh, uh, other kind of hard surface, because that, that, that helps us avoid this sensation of a informal chat session um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, that's the other thing. I really do like to have the camera on a hard surface on the patient side. COVID-19, as I described earlier, I think we all agree as a, well, it certainly is unique and unique is an understatement. Um, COVID-19, how has that affected your professional endeavors with respect to telepsychiatry, if in any way? Well, uh, yes. I mean, first of all, uh, what we saw with the uh, arrival of the pandemic um, and quarantine was an instant conversion around the country uh, of most behavioral health clinicians to offering remote services overnight. Um, and this occurred to such a degree uh, to where uh, the word telepsychiatry almost now be, has become so commonplace as, as to be virtually synonymous uh, with the word psychiatry. Um, uh, in my full-time position now as an on-demand telepsychiatry uh, telepsychiatrist, um, I offer um, emergency services to uh, emergency departments around the country as well as consult liaison services to hospitals in multiple states around the country. And what we saw uh, with the onset of the pandemic was a, a, an early drop in volume. Um, uh, my, my personal opinion is that this occurred, of course, because patients were, uh, for a short time there for a couple of months were avoiding hospitals, avoiding coming into the emergency department to access behavioral health services. Um, also hospitalists on the, on the, on the various floors of the hospitals were initially less inclined to consult psychiatry. I think probably because they were overwhelmed uh, in their conversion to practicing COVID medicine. Um, and so, yes, we did see an early drop in volume. However, that has, after the first couple of months, that has now returned to full, uh, full pre-COVID volume. Um, and if anything, we're, we're busier now than ever. Some of the um, colleagues who are joining us, Doug, for this uh, program might be thinking to themselves, are there implications from a remuneration perspective? In other words, from a reimbursement of service perspective, uh, are there any um, disincentives? Are there any incentives that you see now or you see in the near future that is after COVID's behind us with respect to transitioning to telepsychiatry? Well, um, there, there, as you probably are aware, there, there was already a gradual transition underway uh, whereby third-party payers and insurance companies were increasingly reimbursing for telepsychiatry. Uh, since COVID, the, this transition uh, has, has accelerated dramatically, and now uh, most, if not all, third-party uh, payers and insurance companies, including Medicaid, Medicare, Blue Cross, Cigna, United Healthcare, all of these uh, 
third party payers are now reimbursing uh, for telepsychiatry uh, and even in the home based setting. Reimbursement at par or is there reimbursement less than par? Well, um, in many cases, it's very close to par, if not on par. Um, I, I mean, each insurance company will have its own policies on how close they come to the uh, amount that they would reimburse for an in-person visit. Um, but it, it, the uh, the gap is certainly closing rapidly. Which is good news. That's obviously a very relevant issue to one's practice. Doug, one of the reactions I've had to the literature on, for example, psychosocial interventions will maybe call out cognitive behavioral therapy as a manual-based therapy in depression, for example. The evidence shows that when that type of therapy is delivered through a computer, computer-assisted, computer-facilitated, uh, the outcomes in depression are as good as seeing a therapist in person, which is important for access and scale of the treatments and a variety of other advantages. My question to you is, with respect to telepsychiatry, I mean, you, you have probably more experience than anyone I've ever met, frankly. People might be wondering, well, how do you, in fact, liaise with the primary care provider? In other words, how do you liaise with the circle of care, given what you do? Well, um, in telepsychiatry, we practice exactly the same way we practice traditional in-person psychiatry. Uh, none of those factors change at all, really. Um, and I guess that is really the biggest take-home message um, of all with regard to telepsychiatry. Um, I will liaison with family members, primary care providers, and I still reach out to all the relevant players in a given patient's care, uh, just as we do in traditional outpatient psychiatry. Um, remember, telepsychiatry is not a new form of practice. Uh, rather, it's just a new way of harnessing technology to deliver the same care you're already providing, but to a wider population. Yeah, well put. You know, I have uh, noticed here in Ontario, for example, we've been increasingly embracing a virtual medical home. In other words, we have co-localization of various members of the care team all within the same virtual space. And the patient, of course, provides permission for this and so on. And I have been especially excited about the opportunity that this interface has to, as you talked about earlier, Doug, really deal with the access and availability issue. Uh, it's often said that if we had the cure for schizophrenia or mood disorders today, it would make little, in, uh, little, little dent on the impact of the illnesses because people don't get access to the care. The point being is that this is a major deficiency and perhaps this may be one of the externalities, one of the unintended consequences of COVID-19, not just greater adoption of digital, but perhaps also an opportunity to have a more integrated and a more accessible uh, really framework from the public health perspective. Doug, given your foresight, uh, I don't uh, uh, have any sort of reason to believe that you might not receive some emails from people saying that they want some stock market advice from you because you clearly can see the future. <laughs> okay, we're going to, in fact, now shift directions. We're going to, um, it is really my pleasure, in fact, uh, at this point to invite uh, Mr. John uh, Braggioti to uh, join me here on this virtual platform and share his uh, his experience. And, uh, and John uh, uh, Braggiotti, he is a care provider uh, for his brother. His other brother has a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And John has graciously um, uh, uh, joined us here today to tell really his story. And, and John, I wanna, first of all, give you a warm welcome and very interested in your story. Uh, people would wanna hear uh, about that and especially how things have been affected by COVID-19, welcome. Sure. Well, Dr. McIntyre, thank you for this opportunity to share our, our family story. Uh, we um, we uh, have a brother, as, as you alluded to, that has suffers from schizophrenia. He's had uh, schizophrenia since he was a child. And um, uh, I, I've, I've been taking care of him for, for, for quite some time, uh, intensely since my, my, both my parents passed away. And actually, that's a story that I want to bring up because it intensified with, with COVID-19. So, um, as, as many people in the, in the, in the uh, audience know, the, the best care is to provide, you know, to, to date in person, uh, especially with drastic situations like a family member passing away. Uh, when my father passed away, I was physically with my brother. 
and the psychiatrist, and we had some support around him because we felt that he was going to relapse uh, significantly. And um, and that was that was uh, incredibly helpful. And I wanted to to kind of follow up a little bit also on what, what Dr. Eichelheimer mentioned because. I think it doesn't change from what I see as a, as a brother and as a caregiver, it doesn't really change. Telepsychiatry adds, uh, provides a tremendous amount of support, but it doesn't really change the way you provide the support. So in the past, we, we would have sessions with a psychiatrist, my brother, myself there, and, and perhaps even uh, a, a staff member at the facility that he lives, he lives in a, in a group home. So his, level, his levels of, of schizophrenia is pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's, he's on very significant medications. So in this situation with COVID-19, my mother passed away during this COVID-19. Oh. And um, it added a, a significant amount of pressure because um, obviously I couldn't go and visit him. I couldn't tell him this in person. And, and knowing that he reacted heavily in the previous uh, situation when my father passed away, we, we, I, I, I spoke with a psychiatrist and I said, well, why don't we just do this through telepsychiatry, you know, and, and let's try to create the same support infrastructure that we had done before in person through telepsychiatry. And, and we did that. And, uh, and it was, um, it was, you know, at, at first we felt that it was going to be very challenging, but um, moving forward, what, what I can say in summary is that, uh, it was a session that we had that probably lasted about an hour and a half, which I wasn't expecting it to last that long. Frankly, I thought he was going to shut off, and it 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 he he was very conversant. He was very uh, he became I would say the first few minutes he was a little bit shy, um, but as he saw me as 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 his brother on there, he he became a more more uh, a friendly to the camera. Mm -hmm. And and we were able to to communicate and go through this process. Oh, wonderful, uh, John. Thanks for that. With respect to the um, ability to make appointments and coordinate appointments, how's that? I mean, in terms of just just user friendliness of the platforms, how's that been? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, we, you know, the, I have to say he's he's been uh, in the past. I've I've, I've actually shown him. Uh, uh, capabilities of, of, you know, looking at a screen or, or, or so forth. So he's become a little bit more, um, more friendly to that environment. And uh, what I've done is with the support infrastructure, I've said, look, you know, we, we can't, you know, a phone call, uh, we felt that was not as effective. So we have moved forward in making appointments with him. We've, we felt that um, even though we had a good session with him and I was able to, discussed that his mother had passed away, but his world was not going to uh, change in a negative way as much as, you know, sharing that support infrastructure with him and then finding a continuance to that with making those appointments with the, the psychiatrist and, and also some local support. I know that some, some of you listening uh, know that some of these, these patients are not at home and in their homes that sometimes they're in group homes. And I think it's incredibly important, at least I found it incredibly important to have some support infrastructure also that is aware of the situation, number one. Number two, that you create a continuous situation where they can follow up with, a, with, that, um, with that patient, with that person suffering of schizophrenia, and, and be there for them when, when they're, because there, there's going to be a relapse. We know that. Uh, we, we did have a, re, a, a bit of a relapse, and that's one of the reasons why I worked closely with a psychiatrist to make sure that if we had to make some adjustments to his drugs, um, that we that he was aware of his reactions uh, on the spot so that we were preventive rather than reactive. That's very helpful, uh, John. You know, I was thinking as you were mentioning that, you know, the phone, I've had a number of occasions now in the last six months with some of my patients and families that I see, they don't have Wi-Fi, And I have had some challenges speaking over the phone. Well, not, I can speak over the phone just fine, but I'm talking about having a medical assessment over the phone. And look, we, we have to work with what we have. And uh, I've had some challenges with that, uh, but we've made it work. Um, what do you see as a limitation of phone-based 
versus having the video? In other words, what are some of the advantages of video or some of the limitations of the phone? I think you, sure. you, kind, of alluded, you kind of alluded to that. Yeah, it's a great question. So I um, I have been using the phone with him. I mean, we've been using the phone. We we actually, our situation was that we were away from him as a family. So he was in a different state and different location. He was in group homes because um, as as many of you know, uh, one of the, I think one of the tragedies is that you have uh, people with schizophrenia living at home sometimes and that causes being with a family is not always a sensitive issue and that we can make a, a full session of that, but it's not always the best scenario for them, right? It, it, the family may feel comfortable because they have their loved one there, but it's not the best situation for them. So having him far away meant that I, I uh, for years, used the phone as a support mechanism. And um, I have to say initially, uh, because of his, his, his up and down, he was very up and down with his, his schizophrenia level, when he was able to make outbound calls, um, he would call us at all times of the day. So you could get a call at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. So we, we had to work with that as well. We had right. to limit, we, we reduced, we, we, in other words, we took away um, his ability to make outbound calls for a while. Uh, right. But we kept it regular where he had a phone call that he knew he would get every so often from either myself, the loved one, uh, a, a relative, or as well as 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 help. We could be a caregiver. Um, now, I have to say, I haven't uh, I haven't uh, we, we've used in the past. We've seldomly used some some help from psychiatry through the phone. But what worked the best and I, mm -hmm. and I have to kind of comment on, on what uh, Dr. Eichelheimer mentioned, is that we replicated a very successful model. The successful model that we had was having, with a psychiatrist, uh, with, especially when he, we had a very low, uh, you know, I think they go through highs and lows. So he had a very low uh, situation. We were in person. I was there with a psychiatrist. He was combative, but with a psychiatrist, I, I would leverage that help for him and that was very successful. So we took that same model and leveraged it to to the to the uh, uh, telepsychiatry, uh, which is which has worked very well. Wow, that's amazing, uh, John. Is, you obviously play a very significant role in, in supporting your brother. Are there other members of the team, and either part in the family or professionally, that are part of this team helping your brother? Absolutely, and and uh, I, I have to say that you know, especially during this moment of um, aggravated, as you mentioned, you know, it's not just an economic, but it's also uh, it's it's a common, it's a it's a trifecto, right? It's it's yeah. these three things coming in. So, um, what 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 I found is that because he hasn't been able to see, I I mean, I think it, in in many ways, my brother is 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 privileged in the sense that we are able to see him. We're able to physically see him, but I, I, I've also encountered families. We've helped each other. I talked to families that have, haven't been able to see their loved ones either. They haven't been able to afford to travel, or because of the current situation with COVID nineteen. So, getting support, local support, has been incredibly important, and uh, and we've done that with with a variety of staff. Um, we we've, um, you know, we've had we've had them in different locations. Uh, throughout the years, some have worked better than others. Uh, in in some situations, it's been it's been more difficult to have support infrastructure. But uh, you know, when there's a will, there's a way, and I think that you can always find people, social workers that if even if they don't have the the level of of of, of you know high level of psychiatry needed, but they need to have someone. I think loneliness. You alluded to that. The loneliness. Yeah. Uh, in a, especially with someone that already suffers from schizophrenia, bipolar. My brother's right. got schizophrenia, bipolar, and OCD. Right. High levels of that can cause them to to really go off the rails. Yeah. So even having some support infrastructure really helps. Yeah, that's well, that's very well put, uh, John. And yeah, and I feel it's a, it's a it's a topic we don't speak as much to that being loneliness. And I think as I. You know, when I started today's program, I spoke to resiliency, and I think um, we're going to be looking at this from different perspectives for many years to come. And as individuals and as uh, groups and as, and as a population, we really need to think about how we can become more resilient. And 
One of the ways to boost resiliency is to have a strong social network. So your brother is certainly uh, uh, in a position where he's got obviously a loving and caring brother taking very good care of him and keeping a very watchful eye over things. So uh, your insights and comments are greatly appreciated, John. I'm going to pivot now and I'm going to introduce a very good friend and colleague, um, psychiatrist, Dr. Jonathan Meyer. Dr. Meyer is the clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California at San Diego site. And Dr. Meyer is also at the California Department of State Hospitals and has a very, very extensive history of managing people with persistent mental illness. Uh, first of all, John, welcome. Great to have you with us. Well, thank you for having me, Roger. It's, it's nice to be here. John, let's get right down to it. This has clearly been an event like no others this last six months or so, COVID-19. Um, how would you say COVID-19 is affecting people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar in a two-part question, which you're never supposed to ask two-part questions. But here's a two-part question. What are the coping strategies that you might recommend for people? Well, I think it's fair to say COVID-19 is a societal source of distress. People are suffering from economic distress. People are suffering from isolation. We know that patients with severe mental disorders are vulnerable to stress. So that in and of itself is something that has to be recognized. And I think you allude to this in the second part of your question about the coping strategies. As a big part of what has happened during COVID is people have now become isolated. There was a great survey study which was published in the September issue of psychiatric services from a group at Yale. The respondents were predominantly more so mood disorders than psychotic disorders. But 98% of people who responded to the survey said they had at least one significant concern related to their care as it was impinged by the COVID epidemic. And the biggest issues were either service disruption or loss of access to their medications, having difficulties getting refills. So I think it's really incumbent on us as clinicians to do what we can to help support individuals so they can have access to all of their coping strategies in the forms of a support system. So I thought it was very touching to hear what John has been able to do for his brother. And for one thing, I just want to express my sadness for the loss of his mother. Not only is this a sad event in any individual's lifetime, but certainly during this period of COVID where there's a lot of loss already. So I think what we need to do as clinicians is what I say is follow the three R's, which is reconnect, reassess, and respond. By reconnect, it's not just me reconnecting with my patients, but also helping them reconnect with all of their support structures. Maybe the clubhouse has moved online. Help your schizophrenia patient connect with that. Maybe there now is access to certain psychosocial rehab groups, COG rehab groups. Let's find them and let's reconnect you with them. Most importantly, do what you can to help them negotiate the difficulties of technology. There's a lot of people who struggle with this, and some people simply don't have access. The schizophrenia patient doesn't have a smartphone, perhaps, doesn't have a laptop, but perhaps somebody at the group home does. Perhaps there's a caregiver who does, who can help facilitate the appointment. And often, we're dealing with older individuals sometimes who just simply have difficulties with the technology. Again, maybe there's a loved one, a friend who can help facilitate that connection. As we say, a phone appointment is better than no appointment, but we would much rather have video. We get all of that nonverbal information, which is so important. And most importantly, don't dismiss depressive symptoms as simply expected. Oh, well, this is a stress reaction. We'll call this an adjustment disorder. If the person meets criteria for a major depressive disorder, we have to treat it as such. Yes, a stress can underlie a major depressive episode, but if you're meeting those symptom criteria and severity for two weeks or more, it should be addressed. So I think we all understand that bipolar disorder is a mood disorder, 
But I'm not sure everyone does understand that having schizophrenia means that you have a high rate of moderate or severe depressive symptoms. This is part of the disorder. There's a very famous 12-year study which came out of Germany, followed a group of first episode patients for a dozen years. 40% met criteria for moderate or severe depressive symptoms. If your patient is now meeting criteria for a major depressive episode, you need to reassess them. If they just have a mood disorder, go ahead and treat that bipolar depression with the agents that we now have available. If you have a schizophrenia patient, there's a couple of thoughts. Number one is think about symptom exacerbation presenting as depression. The voices are worse, maybe the delusions are worse, and that gets manifested as depressive symptoms. We know that when schizophrenia patients are admitted to an inpatient unit, about 80% will actually meet criteria for a major depressive episode. Now, a lot of that gets better with antipsychotic treatment, but I think the point is that don't assume it's just mood. Also understand that the underlying symptoms may be transiently worse and need to be addressed. If you feel like that's not the case, antidepressant therapy is very important for patients with schizophrenia, assuming that they have no prior history of mania. And that's a part of the response as well. What we're doing here is to try to treat people the best way we can under a period of extreme stress. It's not surprising you will see a lot of depression, but again, if the criteria are met for a major depressive episode, we need to respond and we need to initiate the appropriate treatment for these patients. Very helpful, John. You know, one of the um, you know observations I've had, I'm certainly not alone in this observation, seeing many of my patients with depression and bipolar disorder, which is the population that, that I provide care for, people are really feeling despondent. They're feeling isolated. We talked about that. There's almost a pervasive anhedonia about life. They feel very disconnected. And then the question is, is are these treatable symptoms of an underlying mental illness? And or are these reactions? Are these, is this a COVID-19 adjustment disorder? What, what, what are your reflections on that? Well, again, Roger, this really addresses what I just discussed. We would say that adjustment disorder is a reaction to a stressor, and it encompasses a certain level of distress. However, once it now meets criteria for a major depressive episode, I think we have to look at it differently. And I'm going to bifurcate this statement based upon whether you have schizophrenia or a bipolar spectrum disorder. If you just have schizophrenia, there's a couple of reasons why you can be depressed. One of them is you just have major depression. We know this is very common. As I said, about 40% of schizophrenia patients have persistent, moderate, or severe depressive symptoms. It's actually part of the disorder and is very common. However, we also know that individuals who are suffering a relapse of their schizophrenia and exacerbation will have even higher levels of depression. So if you look on an inpatient unit, about 80% at the time of admitted for an exacerbation of schizophrenia will actually meet criteria for major depression. Now, a lot of that improves as we adequately treat their psychotic disorder. But I think the most important thing is not just say, well, I'd be depressed too if I was isolated and under economic stress. Uh, that's not acceptable. You have to provide them the treatment that they need, understanding that if they've now met the criteria for major depression, they deserve to be treated as such. As far as the isolation aspect of the question, we really need to do the best we can to reconnect with our patients. And so we would say a phone appointment is better than no appointment. Even better is going to be video because we get that nonverbal information that we don't get just by telephone. The challenge for a lot of individuals is negotiating technology. And this really has nothing to do with whether or not you have a mental disorder. Some individuals are either older and struggle with the technology. Some people simply don't have the economics to be able to afford a smartphone or have access to a computer with a camera. 
So I think what we want to do as much as possible is for those who do have some limitations in dealing with technology is try to help connect them with caregivers, friends, or providers who can help them either set up their laptop so they can use Zoom, show them how to use a smartphone, or perhaps invite them over for a session. Say, here, let's set you up. We'll put you in the room so you'll have privacy, and you can go ahead and do the session. I think John spoke very, very eloquently about what he's been able to do in order to reconnect his brother with the various services he needs. And in particular, for patients with more severe mental disorders like a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, they simply just may not have the wherewithal to figure out that, hey, this group, which I used to belong to, is now meeting online, and here's the way I can get to it. These people who I used to see at the clubhouse are now meeting virtually, and this is how I can reconnect. And so it's important to try to help these individuals as much as possible so they can get back all of their support sources and really do the best they can during this period of isolation. John, as you know, the reports have been very clear that people with pre-existing conditions, specifically morbid obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension, are especially at higher risk of not only being infected by COVID-19, but also having complications like hospitalization and mortality. And we know that people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia have a much higher rate of all of these disorders. And you've contributed to this literature in a very significant way when compared to the general population. Um, so this is something that we're all sort of concerned about with our patients. But here's my question point blank. Do we, in fact, know if antipsychotics, antidepressants, lithium, anticonvulsant mood stabilizer, I can keep going, do psychotropic drugs have any type of effects on the immune system that increase or decrease a person's risk to COVID-19? Well, this is a very interesting question. I think this is the best that we can say is that psychotropics in general do not have a direct effect on immune response. I think as a psychiatrist, my bigger source of concern among my patients is their underlying cardiometabolic comorbidities. I used to do metabolic research in patients with schizophrenia. These are individuals who have twice the population rate for metabolic syndrome, twice the population rate for type 2 diabetes, and to compound that, very high rates of smoking. So all of these present significant sources of comorbidity, which we know makes individuals more vulnerable to the severe sequelae of COVID infection. And so I think it's not appropriate to focus on changing the psychotropics, but more importantly, counseling individuals who you know have these comorbidities to be as safe as possible. And obviously, it's a great opportunity these days if you have patients who are smoking to really let them know this is a great opportunity to consider trying to quit. For one thing, cigarettes are very expensive in many states. They've raised the taxes significantly to discourage teenagers from starting smoking. And now that the news is out there that smoking is one of the big risk factors for having a more severe outcome from a COVID-19 infection, we can perhaps get those people who may have been on the fence about stopping smoking and say, hey, what can we do to put you in a smoking cessation program today? And guess what? These are available virtually. And so they can get the support they need, not just the patches and the gum or the lozenges, but people who stop smoking who have severe mental disorders are five times as likely to fail as the general public. And the general public doesn't have great success either. So put people with all the resources they need in order to have their success. And as I say, this is maybe a great time to talk about smoking cessation if you haven't already, because you might find a receptive audience. Look, this has gone by very quickly. I think we're uh, only scratching the surface. Um, First of all, uh, uh, to my, my professional colleagues, Doug and Jonathan, thank you uh, for your, your words of wisdom here today. And uh, John uh, 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 Bragioti, thank you so much uh, for being with us. And uh, first of all, providing your perspective. Uh, uh, it's certainly what it's all about. It's why we're all here to help patients and families. And I also, in fact, would just summarize by saying this is, like I said, a very unique time. I refer to this as the trifecta of, of, of risk. 
Uh, but my hope, which I think is a, a hope based in reality, is that the externality of this is that we will have a rethink of how we provide care from a health systems perspective, which has really been the elephant in the room with respect to people who suffer from persistent uh, mental illness. And uh, my hope is we'll have a better system for people so they can access the services that they need and they deserve. We thank Synovian for the grant to make this possible, NEI for all their engineering and architectural skills behind the scenes. And I thank all of you for participating today. And I wish everyone a very good day. So thank you all. Take care.